Hello, good evening everyone. Today we'll discuss when and how to limit interventions in the ICU. Why is this question so important? Because in the charged and driven atmosphere in the ICU, one is always talking about saving lives. But that is one environment in which there is high mortality. We sometimes forget what Khaled Gibran alluded to when he said life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. So it's a natural cycle. Dying is a process which has become unnatural in the ICU setting because there are many artificial interventions to sustain life even beyond the time when no cure or salvage is possible. So there are metrics of how the patient dies to reflect the quality of time, which focuses on the appropriateness of therapies and quality of death and dying, quality of communication are new metrics that are very important. It makes us understand how and when to let die. The families of the patient must also know when to let go. This shift of paradigm is important and vital to appropriate care. One may think that critical care and palliative care are polar opposites. That's not true. There is a concordance of values and goals, although the primary and the secondary goals are different. In critical care, the primary goal is to save life or to prolong life, and the secondary goal is to mitigate suffering and improving the quality of life. Whereas in palliative care, Alleviating suffering and improving quality of life takes primacy and saving or prolonging life is also possible in such a situation, but it's a secondary goal. The Society of Critical Care Medicine USA <clears throat> conveyed this model of care in the ICU. When the curative and the palliative components are in parallel, but in different proportions from the time of diagnosis to the time of death. Initially, it is an active disease-directed treatment with a curative intent, with a small component of palliative care. Then it becomes minimized and it becomes evident that curative treatment is not going to be feasible. In the end, there is hardly any disease-directed treatment and in the zone of EOLC end-of-life care, it is almost wholly palliative care until death. And then the caring goes beyond death to the family in post-bereavement care. Inappropriate treatment inappropriateness of care is real. In one survey in the in Europe, it was 23 to 33 percent of ICU care across 85 ICUs. So everybody's agreed that excessive care is an issue in the ICU. The definitions of various modalities of limiting treatment has been carefully uh, determined by this Velpicus worldwide end of life um, uh, promotion in the ICU study, which is across 35 countries and involved more than a thousand intensives in a Delphi process. And 37 intensives from India participated in this process. So you can see ICU therapies by definition involves any life-sustaining therapy that is artificial and includes CPR, endotracheal intubation, mechanical ventilation, vasopressor therapy, artificial nutrition, 
dialysis, blood products, antibiotics, and intravenous foods. Mind you, artificial nutrition also is a life-sustaining therapy. CPR is one which involves cardiac massage and ventilation, and CPR is two regarded as a medical therapy, as an intervention which, like any other intervention, needs consent and needs a weighing of benefit versus harm. If CPR is indicated, this group advises that this therapy should not be offered to patients or their surrogates. Withholding of life-sustaining therapy is not to start or to increase or escalate a life-sustaining intervention when it becomes medically clear that the chances of surviving through this is extremely low or that the patient under present medical circumstances would not want to continue these treatments as they are unwanted and burdensome. Similarly, withdrawal is withdrawal of these life-sustaining therapies in the circumstances that I mentioned for withholding. Brain death is, is equivalent to death in the, in the current understanding of the term. All therapies, the uh, consensus is, should be removed when the brain death supervenes and there is no organ donation involved. End of life decisions have to pass through uh, the prism of ethics and then there are modifiers which may be societal, economic or legal. Uh, this is a model that uh, <clears throat> was first shown by Dr. Rami Rajagopalan, an eminent intensivist from Chennai. We have to be in conformity with the four principles of ethics, which are so autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. The one or the other may predominate, but they have to be passed through this prism. There are societal, economic, and legal modifiers which you go into, and a composite decision has to be implemented through a standard operating procedure. Now, when to initiate discussions and when to uh, start the end-of-life decision-making process and what are the standard procedures or practice points, all this has been well laid out in this uh, publication called End-of-Life Care Policy and Integrated Care Plan for the Dying by the joint statement of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and the Indian Association of Palliative Care. And you can also read an editorial by myself called Coming Together to Care for the Dying in India. To make dying as natural as possible and as humane and holistic as possible. In the beginning, there is the checklist. When to initiate discussions on end-of-life care what are the clinical settings? It cannot be all comprehensive, but it can give us some clue as to what are the scenarios. Advanced age coupled with poor functional state. Note that it's not just advanced age alone. Severe refractory illnesses with organ dysfunctions. Coma due to acute catastrophic causes or situations like dementia with chronic severe neurological conditions with advanced cognitive or functional impairment or progressive metastatic cancer where treatment options have failed or have been refused or post cardiorespiratory arrest with prolonged poor neurological status or any other comparable clinical situations coupled with a physician prediction of low probability of survival. All this is 
being structured in an algorithm of end of life decision making in the position statement I have alluded to there are 12 steps you can see that the top quarter uh, one third of this algorithm involves physicians objective and subjective assessment of the dying process medical fertility and to generate consensus among the caregivers and then to convey with honesty and accuracy and early the prognosis to the family and then also to discuss and communicate all the available modalities of limitation of patients in critical care. At any stage if there is a prognostic uncertainty there should be an iterative process to go back to the beginning and get more expert advice or second opinions and pending any diagnostic certainty or accuracy one must continue full support until these gray areas are clarified. This should be followed by a process called shared decision making process that is a consensus driven through open and repeated discussions. Transparency and accountability should be visible through accurate documentation and consistency among caregivers at all times should be ensured. Then comes the implementation of the process of withholding or withdrawal in a systematic manner. And then effective and compassionate palliative care should be administered to the patient and appropriate care support should be given to the family. And of course one must not forget the after death care, bereavement care support and then there should be a process of review and audit. You can see and wonder whether physician is the one to identify this change of paradigm, how objective it is. But one must understand that strict objectivity in medicine has never been possible. If you compare in a meta-analysis the scoring systems and physician assessments, you can see at the end of it, it's clear that physicians fare better than scoring systems in a situation of end of life assessment and decision making. In decision making, one may be paternalistic in the sense that all these decisions are taken by the caregiver, by the physician, so as to protect the family from such dilemmas or as the trend is more and more autonomy is given to the family of the patient. Neither of this is the ideal. The best that has been approved of by most societies, critical care societies is the model of shared decision making wherein Two, two groups come together. The physician group, which has expertise in the in assessing prognosis and in the in disease states, and the family or the person himself or herself, who is the expert in the values and goals uh, that uh, they want respected. So the best model is this shared one. How do we work towards a shared decision model? Communication is the key. Communication is not only to convey information, but also to generate mutual trust and also to combine to take appropriate decisions. Intensivist or the primary physician must take charge. They must give adequate time these discussions in a proper setting and it should be done in a conference room. It should be done away from the bedside. Curtis showed that there are several missed opportunities 
during family conferences regarding EOLC, we often, uh, at least 30% of the time, fail to listen to comments of the family or fail to acknowledge or address their emotions. And if we fail to explore family concerns, and we fail to reaffirm non-abandonment to the patient. You can see that this is the form that I use in my own practice for proper documentations. It is called Directive for Comfort Care Decision. It is not a consent form. It is not an assent form. It is a joint decision making for comfort care of the patient. In this paper, uh, published in 2009 in Intensive Care Medicine, the process um, and the outcomes are described in end of life decision making. It's a retrospective chart review of consecutive patients admitted between May 2006 and December 2007 in a 12-bed closed medical surgical ICU in a 170-bed tertiary care corporate hospital. So you can see that out of 88 deaths, out of 830 admissions, half the patients received full support and the other half had an end of life decision making that limited interventions. You can see that withdrawal decisions are very minuscule, only 3%, whereas DNR and withholding decisions were equal, almost equally uh, present. So you can see that majority of the patients who receive an end-of-life decision were in some way or the other fully dependent. So the proportion has a ratio for somebody fully dependent as compared to independent pre-morbid state was three and a half times more for an end-of-life decision. You can see that if you compare on the left column those receiving full support before death and on the right column those who received an end of life decision interventions such as mechanical ventilation hemodialysis transfusions and surgery were fewer in a significant manner in the EOLD column antibiotic change Three days prior to death was also far fewer and similar for vasopressors and diagnostic studies. The patients with an end of life decision are spared. You can see in this graph that half the decisions of end of life or treatment limitation took place in the first week. It was not left until too late. It was all done early. And by the third week, all decisions were virtually made. This is very similar to the pattern seen in Canada by Sinef et al. and in the ethical study in Europe. Most of the decisions are made early. So this reflects the fact that prognostic um, disclosure has taken place early and treatment modalities for palliative care and comfort care is discussed very early. The Most of the times the intervention that was withheld was mechanical ventilation or blood transfusion or routine investigation or antibiotics. All this is unnecessary, burdensome, and withholding them saves a lot of economic burdens. I will also show you 
another set of data to reveal the impact of an alarming natural death policy on end of life decisions. This is in a different hospital with a large medical surgical ICU. In, from May 2009 to January 2010, there was no formal end of life care policy in the hospital. Out of 1912 ICU admissions, there were total deaths of 239, that is 15.3% of admissions. End of life decisions for dying patients was done in 7.5%, and half of them were DNR, and a lot of them were withdrawal decisions with hardly any withholding decisions made. You can see that after a formal end-of-life care policy, how there has been an improvement in the number of end-of-life decisions. Out of a similar mortality rate, end-of-life decisions were made in 23% of patients as opposed to 7.5 before the policy. There was a lot of DNR withholding and withdrawal decisions. Withdrawal decisions were 43%. You can see that the average days between admission and EOLD was only 6.6 .6 days in consonance with what is the experience in Canada and Europe. And these were the common reasons for end-of-life decisions. Cancer, neurological conditions, respiratory conditions, and acute conditions such as sepsis was a very minuscule minority. If you look at the US National Survey of End-of-Life Care for Critically Ill Patients, 75% of patients in 131 ICUs across 48 states had an end-of-life decision, that is a treatment-limiting decision. You can see that no resuscitation or DNA formed a substantial proportion, but the majority had a withdrawal decision. In India, this has been difficult. End of life decisions, while they're getting easier in the rest of the world, here it is getting more complicated and we must understand why. In 2011, we had this Aruna Shonbok case, who had a vegetative existence for nearly 40 years. And questions were raised about right to life and whether Aruna Shonbaugh should be subjected to euthanasia. Discussions centered around euthanasia but did not move over to patients' rights and choices. Many myths in our myths in our myths have replaced reality. Do not resuscitate directive or order is one such. It is confused as a form of euthanasia, but actually it is one end of the spectrum of treatment limitation, which is the simplest, as opposed to the other end, which is active euthanasia. Suicide and abetting suicide should not be an issue because the dying process has already started. And we all discuss and are concerned about Misuse of treatment limitation, but do not discuss enough the greater misuse that is possible with uncontrolled interventions in the ICU. So, we follow, because of this uh, uncertainty, legal uncertainty, and uncertainty of perceptions, we tend to follow the burden of path of least resistance. And we continue with excessive treatment in clinical and futile conditions or take recourse to left against medical advice. 
wherein the family signs and then takes the patient away from the hospital due, towards the end of life, unmindful of what are the consequences uh, in terms of lack of palliative care. Thus, we may compromise heavily on the quality of care of the terminally ill and the dying. In our law, there, is, there have been some developments in the last uh, 12 years or so. There was a first law commission report in 2005, the 176th report, which clarified that the state's interest in protecting life is not absolute. And it clearly separates in opening lines that euthanasia is different from limitation decisions in the terminally ill. And it acknowledges end of life decision making as a letting die and clarify that suicide laws do not apply. It accepts patients right to refuse treatment and also declares that medical intervention contrary to patient wishes amounts to battery. However, inconsistent with above declarations, it disallows advance directives. Last year, the NABH guidebook has also focused on quality of end-of-life care and has added 11 more requirements for NABH accreditation. You can see in the COP22, documented policies and procedures guide end-of-life care. So the infrastructure requirements for um, a hospital aspiring for this accreditation is presence of a hospital end of life care policy, presence of physical space where appropriate privacy for the dying can be ensured, presence of essential medication to provide uh, uh, analgesia and symptom control, and presence of trained personnel, and the presence of access to religious clerics, rituals, and bereavement care support uh, are required. And as for the process, there has to be documented evidence to suggest that the patient and family had knowledge of the diagnosis and prognosis of the disease, and documented evidence of consensus on treating team and medical futility and documentation of the same, documented evidence of communication of medical futility and available modalities of EOLC, documented evidence of goals of care, documentation of resuscitation status, allowing natural death, an EOLC management plan, documented evidence that end of life care symptoms were identified and managed. And if the patient is discharged, there should be clear documented evidence of continuity of care. Uh, um, in the discharge summary. There's been some movement and initiatives from the government towards formulating a policy and legislation. Last year, a circular was issued by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in May 2016 for a draft bill, which is termed for the terminal medical treatment of terminally ill patients for the protection of patients and medical practitioners. It, was, it invited comments and proposals from the public and from professionals at the website passiveeuthanasia at gmail.com. We found several gray areas in the bill. And a professional, multi-professional group called End of Life Care in India Task Force Elicit from the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, Indian Association of Palliative Care, and Indian Academy of Neurology found several gray areas in the bill. It found that it used outdated and misleading terminology pertaining to euthanasia and other uh, treatment limitations. It allows a conscious patient to refuse treatment 
with the consent of the family, however, disallows advanced will, which ensures that the patient's autonomy is sustained even when the patient should lose capacity. It suspects one and all when the patient loses capacity and decisions are to be referred to the courts. A court procedure for everyday decisions is not feasible or workable. We must understand what are the consequences if treatment limitation is disallowed or a procedure for treatment limitation made too difficult and unworkable. It would be incompatible with good medical practice principles. Treatment may do more harm than good would lead to immense economic hardships to families and society as a whole, which is imminently avoidable. And it would, of course, deprive millions of life-saving medical resources. So we need to talk about death. We need to talk about death within professionals, and we need to talk about death with the public and with the policy makers. On 29th and 30th of April uh, in Mathura, several professionals and lay public across many walks of life put together the Mathura Declaration in order to alert the society and the policy makers for a call to action for ensuring human care, humane care at the end of life. This is very important because we have not discussed the complexities around dying. We have not explored all the ways in which we can improve the lot of the dying and reduce inappropriate care. So the Mathura Declaration states the following. It says quality of life is a right guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution to every citizen of India and must be upheld, including at the end of life. Palliative and end of life care, EOLC, are important means to insurance. In 2015, India was ranked 67 among 80 countries in quality of death index based on a survey conducted by the Economist Intelligence Unit. We as a nation must examine the reasons why this is so and take swift remedial action. We recognize the initial initiatives taken by fellow professionals and ethicists and also by the government and we want to be able to participate in evolving an appropriate end-of-life care policy for the country. And this is an opportune moment for all of us to come together and ensure that this is done speedily. To sum up, ladies and gentlemen, palliative care initially complements critical care and continues after the latter is no longer appropriate, as we saw in the SECN model. Transitioning of treatment goals from a curative to that of comfort care is a carefully calibrated process. Communication is the process by which this is achieved. End of life care policy, standard operating procedure, documentation and audit of end of life decisions are essential to ensure quality holistic care in the ICU. Thank you very much. I will be very happy to take questions. The first question is from Dr. Rajesh Bala. Yes. How do you suggest 
how do you suggest weaning off a terminally ill patient from the ventilator do you consult the relatives initially and if so what if one of them objects to the same yes no such decision is easy or simplistic we take the patient of the ventilator only through a shared decision making model as i've explained and the exact process is discussed fully in the uh, ifccm iabc position statement briefly what happens is when you identify the patient terminally ill and further continuation of interventions are not going to help the patient this fact is shared with the family and then sometimes they go through denial lack of acceptance but we must see through them through this process with repeated conferencing and addressing of their concerns once understanding between the caregivers and the family is uh, is is uh, reasonable and there is a consensus then a decision for uh, uh for for taking off the support is made through proper documentation next question is from prerna yes estimating the effect of palliative care interventions in advance care planning on ic utilization please please give us a systematic review um you see uh, the the advance care planning there are several uh, studies uh one of them has been in in the jama when in cancer patients uh, there are two groups so those who received uh counseling and uh, about uh, what is to come and those who did not receive surprisingly even in cancer patient only a third of the patients received such counseling when counseling was done and much ahead you know what 6 months in advance of the uh, terminal situation majority of those who received counseling did not come into an icu toward the end they went to a hospice or chose to remain at home and those who did come only 16% uh, had a ventilator and majority of them had refused through through an advance care instrument uh they were majority of them had dnr and did not accept any interventions so this helps this helps in clarifying uh what one's choice is advance care planning means just that it's not just the, only the medical person it is also the paramedics you know counselors or psychologists or even um you know those uh, social workers we chip in and clarify what experience is to be anticipated and what are appropriate decisions next question is from pankaj are dnr orders signed by relatives are valid see in our country the law has not discussed dnr there is no definition in law of dnr in this country everything is confused with euthanasia but medical practitioners know better dnr order was first written in the world in the us in 1975 way back and it was a codified law in 1988 this practice is not regarded as euthanasia by any other legislation in the world therefore we need to increase the awareness of our policy makers dnr is a very legitimate medical practice and it only means not to give an intervention to a dying patient when it is futile and when the patient doesn't want it so it is like any other intervention in medicine without if they refuse to undergo that procedure there is no obligation to do it so i think dnr if it is signed it should be signed by both the doctors and the family it's a joint decision and that can be done because the regular medical practice all over the world
Next question is from Keshav. How important it is for the patient to know that he or she is going to die and how do we handle the collusion during the end of life? Excellent, uh, very important question. You see, we must prepare the patient for death. It's no, no, no longer valid to say that I am going to hold back information from my patient and keep him in the dark or her in the dark uh, in order to be protected. Because respect for patient autonomy, which is so important, involves proper conveying of information and directly to the patient as far as possible or if the patient demands it, it's mandatory. To be able to put gently and compassionately the facts of the case to the patient and prepare for what is to come is extremely important because in life there is has to be a closure and people if they know they take appropriate action toward their end of life and they are at peace doing so and they don't burden the family too much. And the family also is relieved that these issues, uh, moral dilemmas are discussed and emotional uh, you know, responses are done. Each one of us wants a peaceful death. Each one of us wants a comfortable dying process. Many people even go to the extent of traveling to uh, to Varanasi, Kashi for the dying days or to Mathura for the dying days. How is that possible if you don't know what's, what is to come? So I think it's a professional obligation to tell the truth and to prepare the family and the patient when the time has come. Next question is from Vishal. What factors determine the decision of euthanizing a patient? See, euthanasia is an extreme thing. It is a, euthanasia means only one thing. The definition should be very clear. Euthanasia means actively killing a patient as an act of mercy by a physician, by administering a lethal dose. Other things should not be confused with euthanasia. Withdrawal, withholding, DNR, uh, these are not uh, advanced care planning, these are not euthanasia. Euthanasia, as per the current definition, as I've told you, is only practiced in a very few, very few places in the world. The Netherlands is one, Switzerland is another, the state of Oregon, where physician assisted suicide is allowed, these are a few more are now uh, emerging. How do they do euthanasia? It is allowed only in a conscious patient who is competent to take his own decisions and it is done through a strictly regulated process uh, and it has to be uh, of course approved by two independent physicians. Physician assisted suicide is not a direct killing, it is indirect. There is a patient, the physician sets up the process by which the patient can consume the lethal dose itself. This is not to be confused with any of the other treatment limitations. 